And so this week I told you guys that I was gonna do part two today and we were gonna go over the history of the Sabbath from, from, from the documents that we have, the church fathers. Now, this is a topic, guys, and I'm gonna be very real. Can I be real? Anybody been in Hebrew Roots for more than five years? Keep it real. <laughs> Keep it real. <laughs> the patristic writings, the church fathers, right? John Martyr, Ignatius, Clement. These writings that we have from believers from the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth century. I've been in Hebrew Roots going on 14 years now, 2016, 14 years, 13, 14 years. Never once was I taught about these documents. Never once. No, no fellowship I ever went to. And whenever we would bring them up, they would scoot away from them like it's some taboo thing you can't talk about. And the reason is, we don't know how to study actual history, I believe, in a, in a, in a lot of Hebrew Roots fellowships. Um, that's the truth. That's, that's from my experience. When we read something that's historical and we don't understand it, it clashes with our way of believing, we run away from it and we reject it. I've seen this happen with not only the patristic writings, I've seen it happen with actual like Babylonian history. Hebrew rooters, we don't like actual history because we want to define history on how we view it. And so because of that, we have so many different teachings going around, fabricated history about Babylonian mythology and Babylonian uh, history, and then we're trying to call all this stuff pagan because all this stuff started in Babylon, and, and, and a lot of times we we simply carry on sensational information that is simply not true. And when we're shown, I've, I've gotten hate mail, <laughs> hate mail, because I feel like it's part of our job as seekers of truth, if you will, as the followers of Yeshua, as those who claim to be in truth, to represent truth, even if it's hard, right? I'm scaring everybody, aren't I? Even if it's hard, right? And so when I see someone, and I know there's a lot of topics that are debatable, there's a lot of, I mean, even the translation of the, of the letters from these church fathers, patristic writings, the translations, you go online and there's like six, seven different translations and even more than that, but just available online. And different words, different meanings, the context of this, it's debatable. What we're going to show today is very well debatable. I'm just going to show you my findings. There's some stuff that has been proven. And when I see people speaking about stuff that has been proven, it's embarrassing especially if they're trying to represent all of Hebrew roots, especially if they're trying to represent the kingdom of our Messiah, especially if they're trying to represent God. And so I, I can't stand it. I have to say something. Listen, guys, stop spreading this information. Here is the actual evidence of this. And in return, we get emails, false, you're making up stuff, so on and so forth. Um, you want to support stuff or whatnot. And so I feel like we, we've discovered something or we've neglected something with ignoring these letters. How many of you guys know that if we found a first century document of a believer, I mean, first century, right? Like within 20, 30 years of Yeshua dying and resurrecting, pretty close to, you know, disciples, the apostles. If we found a document that supported something that we disagreed with, would we accept it? Uh, first century believers, right? That's what we're trying to replicate. We're trying to be like the first century believers, right? Most of us. <laughs> Most of us. What if the first century believers did something or believed something that we don't want to? That we're taught not to believe. But it's historical based and we have evidence to support it. Would we want to go forward with it? <laughs> You'd pay attention to it. You'd at least consider it. This has been an eye-opening study for me. And I'm very excited to share some of that with you guys today. Um, a lot of church denominations, as we know, the topic is the Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath. A lot of church denominations to support meeting on Sunday and Sunday worship will go back to the patristic writings. Second, third century writings. Look, the apostles did this, the disciples did this. The next generation after the disciples started doing this. Are we willing to acknowledge if second and third century, within two generations away from Yeshua, if this happened, if people started to acknowledge Sunday as an important day of worship, if this is fact, if this is fact, would we be willing to accept this? Scare everybody yet? Everybody's scared? 
Fact is, guys, two generations away from Yeshua, we have writings that support Sunday becoming an up-and-coming day of celebration of Yeshua and the Sabbath slowly fading away very quickly. Didn't even last a hundred years. Why? Why? And that's what I want to share with you guys today. I'm going to get so much hate mail. People are going to watch another video, going to turn this off, write me an email. It's nasty. <laughs> if there's something that we need to consider and that we have histor historical proof to back up, it's our job to uphold the integrity of what we call truth and what we stand for, right? That goes for everything. So, starting this message off, I want to do a little bit of review. We need to figure out, first question, I'm going to ask a series of questions throughout this study. And this study is actually going to be broken up into another part, <laughs> because there's a lot of history I want to share with you guys, and I hope you guys will take notes. And, and if you have any questions about what I said, you can come ask me, you can email me, um, you can, I have copies of the, the letters that I'm going to be presenting today, and you can also go back and watch this video. First question, did the apostles keep Sunday? How did that mess up? <laughs> we'll go up early to, to, to format this. Did the apostles keep Sunday? If the disciples of Yeshua worshiped on Sunday, did away with the Sabbath, right? Did away with Saturday. If that was the case, these are eyewitnesses. If they did this, would we be willing to admit it? And would we agree? Yeah, I mean, yeah it's what it says, right? We're going to go over a few verses that have to do with the Sabbath in the New Testament. We're just going to see the first generation, right? First generation, Acts, okay? So in Acts chapter 13, we have, uh, we have an instance where, where, oh, we can just read it. Now Paul and his party set sail to Papos. There came to Perga, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So they came and they, they came to Antioch, right? It's going to become a huge source for the ecclesia, the ecclesia, 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 or the church, if you will. And they sat down. And after the reading of the law, the Torah, and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them saying, hey, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on, right? And so it's interesting because if you read the chapter, Paul basically stands up and talks about, listen guys, Abraham, Moses, through David, our Savior has been born unto us. Let me tell you about the Savior, Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? He gives this compelling gospel message in the middle of this synagogue, okay? Now, what's amazing is a few verses later, a little bit in the chapter later, after Paul shares Yeshua with them, we see that among all the people, the Gentiles become really interested in this, right? And so in verse 42, we see, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them on Sunday. On the next Sabbath, right? This would be a great opportunity for Paul to be like, Listen, guys, <laughs> that was done away with. We need to we're gonna meet here on Sunday. Meet me tomorrow, and I'll explain it to you. Next Sabbath, can you come back here? Preach to us again? Absolutely. Absolutely. Verse 43, now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Just looking at scriptural evidence, and we're not worried about the generation after this, we're worried about the initial generation, right? The disciples and the apostles, okay? At least in this act, they seem to be pretty committed to the Sabbath, Right? I know, we know this, but Let's see here. Continue on to the next book of the New Testament, right? First Corinthians, which according to Catholic scholars was written between 52 and 57 AD. We find what is probably the single most quoted text used to in an effort to prove Sunday worship. First Corinthians 16:2. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, put money away, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Right? And so Paul is writing to the Corinthians 
that he is requesting money to be saved so that he can distribute the money to the needy saints in Jerusalem. Listen, guy, the whole, the whole, all the believers in Jerusalem, you know, getting a little hungry here. Come on, we got to support each other in this and we have to uphold the integrity of what we have in Jerusalem. Paul is recommending that each person on the first day of the week lay aside and save by themselves a proportional amount of their income for the purpose of this offering. In that way, when Paul arrives, the necessary funds will already be set aside and available. Right? First Corinthians 16, 3. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, let them send to bring your liberalities unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. So upon meeting with Paul, after his arrival to Corinth, that money was to be saved up and be given to the designated courier to be taken to Jerusalem by Paul's direction. Most notably, Paul is not instructing the Corinthians to observe a Sunday worship service. A lot of times, I've read a lot of commentaries, and I always like to look at all the commentaries when I approach a subject, because I like to be unbiased. I really do. Um, it's how I feel, uh, truth, unbiased truth. A lot of commentaries say when they were meeting in their churches on the Sundays to take up, pass the plate and take up an offering to give to Paul. This is not the case. Paul says in your dwelling places, but at home, when you're at home on the first day of the week, right? You reset the work week after Shabbat's over with. Go and count out your money, get all that stuff. Save up some so that you can give it to me and go back. Hmm. It's also very clear in the book of Acts that Paul only kept the Sabbath day when he was in Corinth. You want to see this? Not Sunday. The whole time he was in Corinth. Do I have this in here? Yeah, 18, Acts 18, verse 1. And these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So this is recounting when he's in Corinth, right? And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. How many Sabbaths? And persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So when Paul was in Corinth, he taught, he preached when? Sabbath. Once a Sabbath? Once a month? Every other week? Every Sabbath for a year and a half. Is that 71, 72 Sabbaths? Not once does he say, and on the first day of the week, we gathered together, and I had this cool club down here. We rented this church down here. We rented the synagogue out on Sunday, and they let us use it. And, and we're just looking at first century. And, and, and guys, uh, church scholars, Christian scholars, will admit there's really not a whole lot of evidence that the first century apostles really kept a Sunday service. And we'll see later on, as the letters that we read, we see this graduation or this gradual evolution going towards Sunday. Hmm. It's interesting that in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, in light of tradition, they say that it refers to, like I said, passing the collection plate. It was the most absurd commentary I think I read. <laughs> oh. Also, we have this verse, and I wanted to get this out of the way because I want you guys to, to understand why we do what we do. Last week was how we should feel when we do it and why we do it, and now we're going to look at history. So Acts chapter 2, verse 7, it says something very interesting. It says, on the first day of the week, when we gather together to break bread. Everyone knows with them, right? This one. Poor, poor cat fell asleep in the window, fell out, died. Paul had to go, right? So he says, on the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and the young man named Eticus, sitting on the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. I understand when Paul has to deal with, because I see. Oh, I know. I see y'all. Put you up in a window up there. Deeply, as Paul still talked longer and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, and taking him in his said, Don't be alarmed. His life is still in him. So wake up. They were meeting on the first day of the week. How do we get around this? Can't just ignore it. First day of the week. So there's several different theories. One theory, which I agree with, is that the first day of the week, we know, starts Saturday night, and they were gathered together Saturday night, and Paul spoke till midnight. He didn't speak like Sunday morning all the way through. Right? First day of the week. Um, maybe they had Shabbat services or whatnot, and then he just continued to yak throughout the first day of the week. Why were they there? Because Paul was intending to depart the next day. And he wanted, to have, he wanted to break bread with them one last time. I believe this was an isolated incident. 
It doesn't say as was their custom the first day of the week. It says, Paul's leaving the next day. Come on, guys, you last chance. <laughs> Let me preach to you. I find that very interesting. But while we're, oh, here we have, I have a quote. I want to go ahead and list my sources. I forgot to put a slide in with my sources. Um, one of my main sources is a 400-page thesis from Samuel Bakiaki, right? And he was a Seventh-day Adventist who attended a, a, a Catholic university, a Vatican university in, in Rome in 1977 and wrote a thesis um, on the Sabbath. And, and a thesis is called from, from Saturday to Sunday, History of the Ancient Sabbath, 400-page thesis. It's interesting because the Vatican actually published the thesis. So if you want to link to that, let me know and I can give it to you. It's very interesting, very long, very, very academic, very cool. Another one is a, a book called Hatred, the History of Antisemitism, and as well as The Shadow of the Temple by Oscar Scarlson. Scarlson. That's how you say his name. So here's a quote from Dialogues on the Lord's Day. The primitive Christians had a great veneration for the Sabbath and spent the day in devotion and sermons. And it is not to be doubted, but they derived this practice from the apostles themselves as appears by several scriptures to the purpose. Here we have a scholar telling us what we already know. Obviously, the first apostles, first disciples were Jewish. Obviously, they kept the Sabbath day. We spoke about this last week in what is the Sabbath part one. This is widely accepted throughout Christian scholarship. But Matt, what about the Lord's day? This is a verse in Revelations that is highly debated. And we can read it. Revelations 1.10. You guys ever heard this verse before? Probably never even seen it before. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as a trumpet, right? So on the Lord's day, it's, it's interesting because everywhere else in scripture, the first day of the week is called the first day of the week. Meaton sabbaton, that's what it's called, the first day of the week. Nowhere else in the New Testament is the word Lord's day ever used, except for this point. Now what happens is we start reading third and fourth century uh, writings, patristic writings, and we see that the Lord's Day was combined with Sunday. Earlier writings do not show this, and definitely not at the time of the New Testament. So it's very interesting because what is John talking about? Was he talking about he was having these visions? You know, he was on the island, and he was having these visions of revel apocalyptic visions, and he sat down for his Sunday service all, die, all by him lonesome, right? And, and he, on Sunday, he had these visions. Hmm. It's interesting because we could say it was Sunday, and this is one theory, but there's no evidence that a reformation from Saturday to Sunday was even started yet. No evidence to support this, right? A lot of people, a lot of scholars will say this is Pascha or Easter, the evolution of Easter, the pre-Easter celebration, right? I've seen commentaries with this. This is an interesting commentary because the Christians in the province that Paul, John was writing to did not celebrate the resurrection or the, 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 the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah on the first Sunday after Saturday. There was actually a great debate amongst early Christians. See, in Rome, in the Roman province, they began saying, no, we don't need to celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection on, on Passover. We need to move it to the first Sunday after Passover, which, you know, is actually first fruits, but regardless. But there was still a large majority of those away from Rome, especially in the east, what are they called? They're called quarter decimen, quarter decimites. They believed that they should honor Yeshua on the 14th day of the month of Nisan. In other words, Passover. Because that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, right? He's our Passover. Christians did this. Early believers did this for hundreds of years. It was a huge debate. You can read, Google the, Google the quarter decimen debate on Google, and you can read, I mean, church fathers butting heads over this. I'm not going to do it on Sunday. No, I'm going to do it on Sunday. See, even if John was speaking about the Lord's Day as Easter, the province that he was in did not observe this tradition yet. During this time, everyone recognized Yeshua on Passover every single year, early believers. What's further interesting is if we read the entire chapter of Revelations 1, we see something very clear. What is the entire chapter about? About the end times, right? He talks about, uh, let's see here, in verse seven, look, he is coming in the clouds and everyone will see him, even those who are pierced in, and the peoples of the earth were mourned because of him, so shall it be, amen. 
quoting Daniel 7 and Zechariah 12? What are these prophets talking about? They're talking about the end times, right? This is what John's saying, right? He's taken up in the spirit and he's seeing the end times. And in the Tanakh, the day that comes about where the end times start, what's this day called? The day of the Lord, the Lord's day. This is what the entire chapter reflects. Therefore, Revelations 1.10, I believe, John was taken in the spirit to the Lord's day, on the Lord's day, to see these things unfold. We get so wrapped up in agenda sometimes that we miss the obvious things. When we're on this issue, while we're on this issue, I want to address something. So, can we have a conversation? <laughs> we can have a conversation, right? Okay, a couple people are just looking at me. I don't I already messed it all up, I know. In Hebrew roots, and I can say this, long-time Hebrew rooter, messianic movement, like I said, sometimes we like to see things in completely black and white scenarios. Now, some things need to be viewed in black and white scenarios. Other things, if it's not a black and white scenario, then it shouldn't be, be seen as a black and white scenario, right? One of those scenarios is with Mark chapter 16, verse 1. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they may go to anoint Yeshua's body. This is after Yeshua died on the cross, right? We have the ladies coming up to anoint his body. Everyone's familiar with this verse? The chapter, the concept? Okay. Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now what's interesting, first day of the week. If we look at that in the Greek, we have a very peculiar phrase, and it's right under here, te miaton sabaton, in the Greek. What sticks out at you about this phrase? The Greek word for Sabbath. Oh, we as Hebrew rooters, ha, oh, look, it's not the first day of the week, it's Sabbath, right? Because it's Sabbath, and that's what it means. And so we get bent out of shape because we see Sabbath, and we don't bother researching the actual <laughs> biblical Greek and the culture that the Roman Empire was, was in, and we say that first day of the week shouldn't be there. Everywhere that this word week is, that sabbaton should be Sabbath. True story. True story. The issue with this, guys, is in biblical Greek, there is no word for Sabbath, or for week. There is no word for week. And so what happened is they were still developing the seven-day week. Do the research, totally different topic. So within the scriptures, they took the word sabbaton, and they used that seven, right? Seven to define the week. And so mia means first. And so this phrase literally could mean first after the Sabbath, first day after the Sabbath, first of the week, right? Or it could say the first of the Sabbaths. It could read first of the Sabbaths. This word sabbaton is used all throughout the New Testament for Sabbath and also translated a few times this week. Sometimes, I believe, when we see miaton sabbaton, it means first of the Sabbaths. Other times, the context shows it means first of the week. We see a great example of this in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, Yeshua is telling a very familiar story to his apostles, and he's speaking about a righteous Pharisee, right? And, and we, can, we can read it. And he told a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So we got the big righteous guy, and then we got the guy who's already just evil, tax collector, right? The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like this other man over here extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful on me. And Yeshua, of course, is trying to uh, develop, listen, you got this one guy who's obviously self-righteous, and you got another guy who's actually knows he's a sinner. He knows he doesn't deserve God's grace, yet he still goes to the Father and says, Father, forgive me. Be merciful on me. I need your grace, right? So what's very interesting is this Pharisee says that he fasts how many times a week? Twice a week, right? Disto sabbaton. If sabbaton only means Sabbath, this guy is so righteous, he fasts twice a Sabbath. Maybe breakfast, maybe lunch. It's twice a week. I fast 
two of the seven, if you will. It could be, it could be read two Sabbaths, or two in a Sabbath, but the context clearly shows that. Another time we see in Mark chapter 19, verse 9, now when he rose early in the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Patos sabbaton in the Greek. If this word is Sabbath, he arose early on the Sabbath. <laughs> arose early on the first Sabbath, and he appeared to Mary Magdalene. It means he rose Saturday morning. Really messes up a whole three, days, <laughs> three nights thing, guys. I'm not saying that sabbaton doesn't mean Sabbath. It absolutely does. The majority of the phrases we see in the New Testament. But I want to at least petition that we understand that sometimes things aren't black and white. I saw one review, one webpage that was making them, because I want to see this, you know, is this, could it be Sabbath? I saw one whole webpage where a guy was so adamant that every single time Sabbaton appeared in the Greek in the New Testament, it meant that, and he referenced on, on Mark 16, and he actually had a map that said that Yeshua rose early Saturday morning. And he was a Wednesday nighter, so Wednesday night he died and rose Saturday morning. I'm like, dude, you just undid the whole three days, three nights thing. Which is actually something that, oh, sacred cow. None of the patristic writings, even though the first century, uh, everyone agrees that he died on Friday. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying we have evidence that majority of people thought he brought on, died on Friday, rose on Sunday. The whole inclusive reckoning thing and all the times in the New Testament where it talks about he rose in the third day and on the third day as opposed to after. Different conversation. The only time, though, that the first day of the week is associated with the Lord's Day in all historical documents comes from a pseudo-author called the Gospel of Peter in the second century AD. So if you've ever had friends talk about, you know, where this author said this or the Lord's Day means this, you can tell them that in no writings in history up until the second century is the title the Lord's Day, like in Revelation, associated with the first day of the week except for in the second century, late second century. Did Constantine create Sunday as a day of worship? Can someone get me a water? <laughs> this, is, this is a big one. Because, like I said, when I grew up in Hebrew roots, I, grew, I literally grew up in Hebrew roots so from, from teenager. Is that for me? Thank you so much. appreciate that. I started this journey when I was 17 years old. I read a lot of stuff. I used the internet as my main source for everything. I listened to a lot of different teachers. And I've realized, it, unfortunately, it was way later that I realized that a lot of the stuff I read was disproven in the early 1900s about a lot of different things. I was taught growing up that Constantine created Sunday worship. He changed everything. He created the Christian faith. He created the Catholic faith. This is the guy. Guys, if we look at history, Constantine did not create Sunday worship. He was the climactic event that made Sunday worship law in Rome. Guys, it was developing long before he was ever born. Truly. He was not the originator of this idea. The climactic event, conclusion, but not the originator. Here's what he wrote in law, 321 AD, right? On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest. So on Sunday, right, the honorable day of the sun, let them rest and let all the workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuit. So he's, he's basically instituting Sunday as a type of Sabbath day. So in the cities, we're going to close the shops, don't do anything, rest, take a break. If you're out in the country, you know, most of the slaves were, eh, keep on going, it's okay, you know what I mean? <laughs> Didn't want everything to shut down. Because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting, lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be closed, given the seventh day of March, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. This is the decree from Constantine where he wrote the seventh day or the first day of the week as a Sabbath into Roman law. As I said, guys, this was not something he woke up one morning and said, you know what, all you believers who keep the Sabbath, we're going to do this now. That is not true. And unfortunately, I used to, I used to, not teach, this is before I started teaching, I used to evangelize with this fact, and I wondered why all of my, my brothers and sisters in Messiah 
didn't take me credible. They thought I was a loon bag. Now I realize, because they had actually studied a little bit of history. Was that a big one? Sorry, guys. <laughs> I want to start with possibly one of the oldest patristic writings, if you will. The, the earliest writing we have after Yeshua died and was resurrected. Okay? It's known as the first epistle of Clement. It is not from Clement. It is an anonymous writer. We don't know who wrote it, but it was attributed to this guy. Okay? Written somewhere around between 50 and 80 AD. It's debatable. Very early, right? Within the generation after Yeshua. He writes, By reason of sudden repeated calamities and reverses which have befallen us, brethren, we consider that we have been somewhat tardy in giving heed to the matters of dispute that have risen among you, dearly beloved, and to the detestable and unholy sedition, so alien and strange to the elect of God, which a few headstrong and self-willed persons have kindled to such a pitch of madness that your name, once revered and renowned and lovely in the sight of all men, has been greatly reviled. He's speaking to Corinth. He's writing Corinth, and he's basically saying, listen, guys, you guys used to be top-notch. I mean, you were the shindig over here, right? You were the, fe- you were the ecclesia, but a p- couple of men came in there, and they wanted to be rowdy, and they wanted to start arguing over stuff, and they wanted to start, you know, not seeing unity as the main priority among you, and they wanted to get their way and their view of what Messiah did and their view of all the nitpick areas that, that, that the Bible deals with, and, and they wanted to do all this stuff, and now... <laughs> No one even wants to come to you anymore. You're not even taken seriously anymore because your fellowship is just a big circus now. This writer is very interesting. Like I said, we don't know who's writing this letter, right? And he goes through and he's saying a lot of good stuff about this fellowship and a lot of bad stuff as well. One thing that all scholars agree is this guy was Jewish, naturally. He was familiar with the Old Testament. He names the pious of the Tanakh as his own ancestors, And there's absolutely, and this is important for later, absolutely no anti-Judaic polemic or arguments made. Unlike most of the patristic writings that we have, this guy was not saying Jews are bad or we need to separate ourselves from the Jews or Judaism, we don't need to keep all that. Nothing. And especially nothing written about Sunday was in here. Nothing. Good place to start. Earliest letters, right? No one's writing. It's not a big issue yet. Still keeping Saturday Sabbath for all we know. The book uh, quote from In the Shadow of the Temple. We have Oscar's quoting, Oscar Scorson. If we remove these features, references from Christ and the apostles and high Christology that's written throughout this letter of Clement, we would hardly dis- destroy its main structure and we would have a text that rather characteristically or is rather characteristic of diaspora Judaism in style as well and content. In other words, for all intents and purposes, everyone agrees there's a Jewish guy writing to these guys, admonishing them and rebuking them. The next oldest debatable patristic writing, church father writing, is a writing that we never touch in Hebrew roots. We're scared of it. I only know one teacher in the Hebrew roots movement, if you will, that has ever done a teaching on this, and that's Ryan White over at Rooted in Torah. Okay? Anyone ever heard of the Didache? Okay. Do what? This? Interesting. Interesting. Thank you for that. Ryan does a six-part teaching on this. And it's very interesting because it has a lot of Jewish connections in it. The Didache is estimated to have been written around between 50 and 80 AD. Some people believe that the first epistle of Clement is older. Either way, this is the first generation after Messiah that we have this nice little chunk of document here. And it's known as the teaching, formerly the teaching of the 12 apostles. And this document is written for first century believers who were basically converting to the faith. <laughs> Has a lot of do this, do that. If you don't want to do this, too bad, you got to do this. This is the structure of how things are. It addresses baptism. It addresses the dreaded Eucharist that Hebrew readers are always scared to study. It was a big deal. It comes from a Jewish word, actually, or a Hebrew word in the Greek, but regardless, another teaching. In chapter 6, it it says something very interesting. It says, See that no one causes you to err from this way of the teaching, since apart from God it teaches you. For if you are able to bear the entire yoke of the Lord, you will be perfect. You're going to bear the entire yoke of the Lord, you're going to be perfect. 
But if you are not able to do this, do what you're able. <laughs> and concerning food, bear what you're able. Some kosher laws, bear what you're able. Listen, guys, we know, we know you bunch of pagans out there. If you're able to bear everything awesome, let's gonna start you off slow and to do what you can and following after the ways of Yeshua. Even in, even in food, do what you can, right? In the way things that you eat. But against that which is sacrificed to idols, be exceedingly careful, for it is the service of dead gods, or as we spoke about in the afterlife teaching, the deified dead. I like that. Listen, guys, you want to join the faith? You're welcome. Come on in. If you can take on everything, all these laws and restrictions, awesome, you're going to be perfect. But if you can't, if you can just start off slow, do what you can, right? Do what you can. Bear food, do what you can. Eat in the way, do what you can. Just make sure, number one, just like in Acts 15, stay away from food offered to these idols, right? One thing that's very interesting about the didache is the baptismal rules. I love it. I love it. Um, you guys ever seen, been to a Catholic church? Seen a Catholic baptism? Majority of Catholic baptisms, majority of them, uh, are, are done with a few splats of water over the head, right? And Protestants get all torn out of shape over this, right? Hebrew rooters, Messianic, get all torn out of shape over this and freak out. Oh, you're supposed to do a full immersion, right? Formally, you are, all right? Eighth Orthodox from the majority still do full immersion, but not in the Catholic church. <laughs> they get this from the didache, from the first century instructions to the believers. So in the didacte, it talks about baptism, and it says, listen, guys, if you have a believer, you got someone who's going to get, come to the faith, you need to baptize them. It's important. Paul even stressed this. Got to get them baptized, right? Full immersion in living water would be perfect, just like in Jude, you know, Jewish law. Full immersion, living water. Got to make sure, either a mikvah, river, whatever, living water. If you can't do living water, it's more important than the ritual. Dunk them in a pool of standing water. Just get them under the water and come back up, right? All right, if you can't do it in cold water, do it in warm water. Just do it. And if you don't have any water at all, if you don't have big old pools of water, just baptize them in the name of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and splash water on their heads three times, just like with a cup. Boom, they're in. Just do it. Matt, do you agree with this? Do you not agree with this? It doesn't matter. That's what's written in this very original document, written by believers in the generation after Yeshua within the first century. And so most Catholic churches have, you know, the last resort has kind of become the standard. But the focus was, listen, not on, oh, you want to become a believer in Yeshua? Sorry, we got to go, the mikvah's like a couple miles away, we're going to go. Remember in Acts chapter 8, Philip, right, and the eunuch, I need to get baptized. I don't know, man, there's some water right over, there's a river right over here, stop the carriage, get off, go dunk. And they both came out, the eunuch was rejoicing. Didn't matter if it was a formal mikvah. There's some water over here. Go do it. The dake is very interesting to read. Unfortunately, nowhere in the dake is Sunday worship mentioned as well. Two oldest documents in Christian history do not mention the Sabbath or specifically Sunday worship. Something that we need to be aware of, right? Ignatius. <laughs> Ignatius is possibly the third oldest writing. You guys ever read any of this stuff before? You have? A few people? Somewhere around 105, 115 AD, this letter was written. And uh, he was the bishop of Antioch in Syria, and he was arrested, sent to Rome to be killed, and essentially on the way, visited a lot of Christian communities, wrote some letters, and we have those seven letters, I believe, still with us. Now, what's interesting about this document is one thing is for sure, he was not Jewish <laughs> at all. You want to read some of this? This is interesting. So you guys remember when, when I spoke about, uh, we didn't have it on YouTube, we didn't have it recorded, but I was concluding the Paul series, and I was talking about the works of the law, and I was basing it off the, the Christian scholar publication, N.T. Wright, uh, who's backed by E.P. Sanders, two major Christian scholars called The New Perspective of Paul, right? And he has a theory that has changed the way Christianity has viewed the term works of the law, right? And basically what he proposes is he proposes that the works of the law had nothing to do with Torah directly, Right? We have some other phrases in the Qumran scrolls of the works of the law, and they're defining halakha and how you identify yourself in the covenant. In other words, he says that in the first century, especially after the Maccabean revolt, it became very, very, very important in Roman, uh, Roman when Rome was over Judea, 
to distinguish yourself and make sure that you represent your identity as a Jew, as a Judean, above all. Right? Read the book of Maccabees. That's where it really started to come up. And so the idea in his theory he proposes is that in the first century, the Torah, specifically certain things of the Torah, like circumcision, Sabbath, these were no longer done out of faith. These were done out of identity markers. I keep the Sabbath as a symbol of my God. No, I keep the Sabbath because I'm Jewish. And if you want to be Jewish, you have to keep the Sabbath like me, according to these rules, according to this halakha. This is the jersey you put on. And because you're a Judean, you now know, or everyone can see that you're in the covenant. Circumcision? I live like four months travel away from Jerusalem. I'm not going to be going to Passover, which is, you know, really the only required feast to go and get circumcised. I'm not going to be going for another year. I'd like to go next year. Nope, you've got to be circumcised today. That's the first thing I got to do. I just said I got baptized. It's a theory. This is what Paul was speaking against in Romans chapter 4. All right? By faith, Abraham believed. He wasn't circumcised when he was believed, right? And he calls out the Judeans that he's writing to. He's saying, listen, guys, you think you're better than Abraham because you have these tokens of identity? Let's read what Ignatius speaks about, possibly with this context. Debatable. Magnesians, right? And so when he spoke to the Magnesians, um, they, they produced a lot of uh, dairy, milk. We still have this today in the grocery store. Milk of Magni. <laughs> Be not seduced by strange doctrines, nor by antiquated fables, which are profitless. For even unto this day, we live after the manner of Judaism. We avow that we must not receive grace. For the divine prophets lived after Christ Jesus. So basically he's saying, if you live after the manner of Judaism, you're far from grace. This is a big document. We need to understand the context of this because if he's saying, saying what I think he's saying, that if you do anything that's Jewish, including keep the Torah, you're not of faith in Yeshua. You have no grace. Now we're believers in Yeshua and we want to emulate Yeshua. And if this was what this is saying, then we got a problem, right? Take off the tassels. We'll move services tomorrow. It's going to be hard to rent a church on Sunday, whatever. And then to make the point, to drive the point home, he says this, for the divine prophets, the prophets in the Tanakh, lived after Messiah. In other words, the divine prophets were looking forward and they were living after the faith in Messiah, is what he's proposing. This is what they were going towards. This was their goal. Okay. Okay. Quite a zealous statement. For then those who had walked in ancient practices attained unto newness of hope, no longer sabbatizing, but fashioning their lives after the Lord's life. The Lord's life is a phrase suggested by linguistics uh, scholar Fritz Guy. On which our life arose, also arose through him and through his death, which some men deny. It is monstrous to talk of Jesus Christ and to practice Judaism. For Christianity did not believe in Judaism, but Judaism in Christianity. Boy, he's bold, you know. We don't believe in Jews. The Judaism, we're the fulfillment of Judaism. That's what it appears he's saying. Wherein every tongue believed and was gathered together unto God. Now, either Ignatius was a moron, or he, we're not understanding what he's saying. So he's saying that if you live after any manner of Judaism, sabbatizing, right, you fall from grace, for the divine prophets lived after Messiah. We need to reflect what the divine prophets did, right? All the prophets in the Old Testament. Did this guy not realize that the prophets of the Tanakh kept Sabbath? Guys, what he's talking about, he's talking about the same thing Paul was dealing with in Romans chapter 4. Listen, guys, you need, to, you, need to, you need to watch yourself because your identity as a Jew is not what's going to save you. That's not going to save you. Your identity in Messiah is what's going to save you. So you can put on these identity markers, you can put on the Judean jerseys and wear these things, but guys, you've fallen from grace because that was the whole point of Messiah coming is so that the fulfillment of Abraham could, be, could take place. All nations will be blessed or grafted in through Abraham. Interesting. Sabbatizing. Hmm. Philadelphians 6.1. But if anyone propound or teach Judaism unto you, hear him not. For it is better to hear Christianity from a man who is circumcised than Judaism from an uncircumcised. But if either one or the other speak not concerning Jesus Christ, I look on them as tombstones and graves of the dead, whereon are inscribed only the names of men. He's speaking here of some heretics. 
A lot of the Christian scholars call them Judaizers. I guess you could use that term. I don't really agree with that term, but apparently he's saying, listen, man, if, if someone's trying to teach you Judaism, the ways, the manner of Judaism, don't listen to them, for it is better to learn about Christianity from someone who's circumcised, a Judean, than one who's uncircumcised. So he's saying that, listen, man, it's better to learn this faith from a Jewish guy, but don't listen to someone who teaches Judaism? No, he's talking about a, a rising moment where... <laughs> without getting into different sects of Christianity, including the, the Gnostics, um, he's getting into an area where these Gentiles, Gentiles were teaching Jewish identity was required in the name of Jesus Christ. What's more profound is, and we'll just take it as it is, this is, what, less than 100 years after Yeshua. But if either one of those, circumcised, uncircumcised, tries to teach you anything about the Bible, but does not do it in the name of Jesus Christ, don't even listen to him. There is tombs and gravestones. Is this wisdom? I had a, a messianic rabbi tell me at a conference. He looked at me and he was, he was, he had his opinions on stuff and we agreed to disagree on a lot of stuff, but one thing that was said was that if anybody, specifically anyone who is not born Jewish, wants to teach or evangelize Right? Specifically teach Torah, but do any type of biblical teaching, they must first put themselves as a tutor underneath an Orthodox rabbi, even if he's not messianic. First generation after Yeshua disagreed with that. Let us note, quote from Samuel Bakiaki. Let us note, on the other hand, that Ignatius, by urging Christians to differentiate themselves from the Jewish practices, such as sabbatizing, offers us significant insight on how the existence of anti-Judaizing attitudes and efforts contributed to the adoption of Sunday observance. See, Ignatius condemns first century Judean practice of Torah, not the actual practice of Torah. I'm going to submit over this week and next week a lot of evidence that will show us what happened between Christians and Jews, non-believing Jews. According to historical fact, we're gonna read a lot of hard things, but the sum of it is, guys, there began to be a division between Judeans and Christians. Remember all the things that were going on in the first century, right? You had the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, a little revolt there. Did you know 40 years later, they were allowed to rebuild the temple? Just not in the same spot went back and forth, back and forth, started to rebuild it. Another revolt took place until finally the Balkarkba revolt. It's interesting because there was a huge war going on between the Judeans and the Romans. And you had all these messianics over here saying, listen, we know Messiah's come. We won't be involved in this. Caused a lot of division between those of the Jesus and those who were non-believers. Barnabas. Barnabas is, is another anonymous letter. Um, it's a letter that's attributed to Barnabas, right? Paul's around 130 AD. And we see something very, 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 very specific here. He, we know he's not Jewish um, due to the huge number of misquoted Old Testament and even rabbinic writings. He, he knows a lot about Judaism of the first century, but he misquotes everything and without context, he pulls it out. He agrees that all ritual commandments in Torah are binding to Christians as well. I repeat, Barnabas said all the commandments in Torah are binding to Christians, every single one of them, but not literally. Spiritually. Spiritually. See these weird ideas getting in, right? And he rested the seventh day means this. This is what he, the letter says. When his son comes and destroys the time of the lawless one and judges the ungodly and changes the sun, moon, and stars, then he will rest well on the seventh day. Further, he says, you shall treat it as holy with clean hands and a pure heart. If then anyone can now, by being pure in heart, treat as holy the day God declared holy, we are entirely deceived. In other words, he's saying, because you're not pure, you can't even keep the Sabbath. His opinion. Observe that we will find true rest and treat it as holy only when we shall be able to do so by having ourselves been made upright on the promise fulfilled. 
when there is no more disobedience. But all things have been made new by the Lord. Then we shall be able to treat it as holy after we have been made holy ourselves. In other words, this writer, obviously a Gentile, has this whacked out idea that everything's spiritual and Sabbath can't even be attempted, right? Because you're not holy. When, when God comes back and everybody's completely obedient to everything and everything's been restored, then we can try this again. Further, he says to them, your new moons and Sabbath I cannot endure, quote in scripture. You see what it means. It is not the present Sabbaths that are acceptable to me, but the one that I have made on which, having brought everything to rest, I will make the beginning of the eighth day. This is possibly one of the first times we see this reference of an eighth day form, and I'll explain that in a second. That is the beginning of another world. This is why we also observe the eighth day with rejoicing, on which Jesus also rose from the dead, and having shown himself, ascended to heaven. We notice that the writer's talking about this eighth day, and if you think eight, there's not eight days in a week. No, eight comes after seven, right? And basically what he's saying is we have the Sabbath day that, that we really can't keep, but then as we go past the Sabbath into the eight, the infinite number, is very eschatological number, spiritual number. Um, as we go into the letter eight, right, which is outside of time and space, it is God's domain. He's getting really, really Gnostic with this junk. As we go into this eighth day, we will serve the Lord. It is another world. It's noteworthy that Barnabas presents the resurrection as Jesus as a second or additional motivation. He's talking about keeping the eighth day, and then he's telling them why they need to keep the eighth day. A little detail we like to notice. Sunday is observed because that day Jesus also rose from the dead. This bespeaks a timid and uncertain beginning of Sunday keeping. The theology and termination of Sunday are still kind of <laughs> a little dubious. <clears throat> There's no, no, no mention of any Sunday gatherings, nor any anti-Judaism in the fathers or the origin of Sunday. There's no mention of any gatherings of Eucharistic celebrations. He's not giving any reasons why we should keep Sunday. The eighth day is simply a prolonging of the Sabbath. This eschatological Sabbath, this spiritual Sabbath that we enter into, to which is united by memory of the resurrection. It's interesting. We know that Sunday keeping was not really in play or mandatory before this because he's having to give reasons. You guys know why we keep Sunday? No. Nope. It's spiritual. Spiritual of what? Spiritual of a new world, a beginning after the Sabbath. Okay. And, and it's also the day that Jesus rose from the dead. So why did this attitude start to form? So, so far we find no concrete evidence of Sunday gatherings replacing Sabbath. At least concrete. I mean, this is the time when Sunday will replace Saturday. It's very interesting. Hmm. These are writings that talk about stuff, like I said, that we're uncomfortable with because maybe we miss the context because maybe we're too scared to study it. Suggests that we shouldn't be scared to study documents that support our faith. Next week, we're going to talk about Justin Martyr. I don't know what his nickname was, but Justin Martyr. This guy spoke a lot about heretics. Now, heresy was something that was really, 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 really fun to read about. Um, uh, oh, I got to save that slide. Um, in other words, there are a lot of denominations coming about in the second and third century of, of Christian. They weren't even denominations. They were thoughts. And a lot of them were from the Gnostics. Now, these Gnostics existed during the time of Judaism, the first century. They started to really form up. But with the added uh, advent of Jesus, they began to spin it out of control. And basically what they taught is that in, in a manner, in a shade, that we were all basically falling spirits from God and that we had forgotten that we were divine in and of ourselves and that the whole purpose of Yeshua coming was to give us the knowledge, Gnosis knowledge, Gnostics, that you are divine and you can be freed, right? They were very anti-materialistic in every which way or form. Um, and then we have heretics like, uh, what's his name, Marcion? Some of that, yeah. And he was a heretic. He was driven out of, geez, he was driven out of what, the, the, the West. He was driven out of Rome where he started a church. And this guy was a piece of work. Um, he taught that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were two completely different deities, right? This is this guy. And he was labeled 
many times, uh, Eusebius, I think, calls him Tertullian, he was labeled by multiple church fathers as a heretic, right? And he says the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, is the evil God. And Jesus came representing the higher divine God that was over Yahweh of the Old Testament. And, you know, this new God kind of kicked the old God's butt a little bit. And you know what? Let's just make a Bible to clarify this stuff. So he made his own Bible, and it contained the book of Luke, and it contained the apostles of Paul. That's it. <laughs> just do it over the Old Testament. Everything the Jews do, their worship is from another God. Guys, that, that spirit still exists today. Have any of you guys ever, ever spoken to someone and they say, well, that was the God of the Old Testament? Our church fathers, even though they begin to get misguided, and we're going to cover that history next week, un- heresy, absolute heresy. You want to see something else? A little nugget? Dustin Martin? So he's talking about heresy. Do I have the slide? Oh. It's supposed to be, to be continued. Let's see here. So he's talking about heretics. So he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. Are you guys ready for this? This is a heresy from Justin Martyr. Okay? Some traditions die hard. So he's talking about heretics, and he's teaching his heretics within the body, and this is what he says. For I chose to follow not men or men's doctrine, but God and the doctrines delivered by him. For if you have fallen in with some of those who are called Christians, but who do not admit this truth, and venture to blaspheme the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who say there is no resurrection of the dead, and that their souls, when they die, are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they are Christians." Just saying, right? I'm not going to say my stance on this or this. You watch the afterlife teaching, kind of see where I lie. This is incredible. This is a church father describing a heresy and believing that you go to heaven after you die. We see how the patristic writings have been combed through. Some things have been taken out of some, some left out, never to be seen again. I think it's our job, guys, to take a look at these writings and kind of see what happened to the Sabbath day. Next week, we're going to go into more of Justin Martyr and his letters to, uh, to um, oh, the Jewish guy. What was his name? Trifone? Trifone, Trifone. I heard it said it in different ways. Yeah. This Jewish peer, if you will, and they argue back and forth over Judaism and Christianity and some of the things, the hate that came about because of the things the Jews were doing against the Christians and the Christians were doing against the Jews really developed a wedge in between the relationship between the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith and what became of the Gentile Christian faith within just a couple of centuries. Hope you guys will join us next week. I'm very excited to continue on with this and talk a little bit more about history um, It's truly incredible, the things that we find if we just simply open up and look at a book, right? Did you guys learn anything today? Is that interesting? At least a little bit? Okay. Hey guys, I'm Matthew Vanderels, pastor at Founded in Truth Fellowship, and I really hope you enjoy this message. If you would like to see more messages and teachings like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking here. You can also visit our website to find out more information about our ministry and what we do right here. And if this message has been edifying to you, please consider supporting us and the ministry through our secure online giving portal here. This will ensure this message, along with many others, will continue to reach those who find themselves far from God. If you'd like to write us, you can do so at Founded in Truth, P.O. Box 38042, Rock Hill, South Carolina, zip code 29732. You can also check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash founded in truth. I pray that you stay blessed. I pray that you guys stay encouraged. And I pray that you stay fit. Founded in Truth. We'll see you guys next time.